Paul is preaching, the Holy Spirit is doing this. He is in the earth. He is making um, movements across the, and he is going in front of Paul, um, you know, leading men's curiosities or opening up their hearts and their minds so that when Paul brings the gospel message, it has some type of an impact. And we're going to read about a few of these uh, occurrences today, and some of them uh, more interesting, uh, because Paul obviously leading an interesting life. In the first episode that we're going to talk about in the 17th chapter of Acts, it is the time where we have left off last week's lesson where he had gone over into Greece. First time that the gospel had been preached in Europe uh, at the time, and, and uh, of course he, he suffered many things there. But as we enter into the 17th chapter, he is still on his second missionary journey. He's still there with Silas and Timothy, and, and Luke, the writer of Acts, is with him. And they are in Thessalonica, which is a part of Greece, and they are having a wonderful time in Thessalonia as they're preaching the gospel in the synagogues and in the marketplaces and things like that, which is what Paul would typically do. We find that Paul is expanding his gospel message, not in the message itself, but in where he's going. Remember, we've learned that his typical, when he enters into a city, he'll go to the synagogue where the Jews and certain uh, Gentiles and Greeks have gathered. He'll go into these synagogues and he'll preach the gospel of Jesus because the synagogues are full of people who know the Old Testament. They know the prophecies of the coming Messiah, so he is using that uh, to, to speak about Jesus. But now we find that in Greece in particular, he is starting to venture out of the synagogues and going into the marketplace. He's evangelizing on the street here. Anywhere there's a group of people that gather together, he's going to preach to them and spread the gospel that way. And this is kind of the, the, the way that he has chosen to do it. So as he's in Thessal Thessalonia, uh, the Jews that are hearing about him preaching Christ, they come into the synagogues and they threaten and they run him out of town. And, and the, the people say, well, let's send him down to the Berea. Berea is a, a place further away from Thessalonia, and they're, they're more welcoming. So he goes down there, and he starts pe uh, preaching to the Bereans in the synagogues. And then those same Thessalonian Jews hear about it. He's down in Berea. Let's go down to Berea. And they run him out of there, and the Bereans say, well, let's do this. Let's send him over to Athens, uh, the cultured city of Greece. Let's go send him to Athens. We'll send a couple of our brethren with him. So they sell him over there to Athens, and when he arrives, um, he is shocked to see what he sees. Verse 16 of, of this chapter 17 is not in your uh, qu quarterly, but I want to pick up uh, where it says, and it says, And while Paul waited for them at Athens, Paul is going to Athens by himself, waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, who are still over in Berea. And while he's there, he's first time probably in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. The whole city of Athens. Now, this is the city of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato and Cicero, all these philosophers that we've heard about throughout our studies and throughout our school years. Athens was the cultured and educated city in Greece. And yet, when Paul gets there, he is shocked to see how it's entirely given over to idol worship. There are statues of gods everywhere. There's temples everywhere. Everywhere he goes, he sees another temple or some type of a monument or statue to a god. And so what he's doing is while he's there, he's troubled in his spirit, and he decides to go into the synagogue and start preaching here in Athens. And this is what happens. Therefore, he disputed or disputed or debated or reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, just like he always does. He's going into Athens and speaking to the Jews. Now, it's very important to remember, too. Athens, full of idolatry, but in the synagogues, the Jews do not worship idols anymore. Remember, this was what plagued the Israelites in the Old Testament. They could not get away from idol worship. But God punished them by having them um, exiled to Babylonia, and it was only after being released by the Persian king Cyrus as they came back and rebuilt their city of Jerusalem and rebuilt their temple. After that time, we never see them falling prey to idol worship again after they return uh, from their ex ex exile. So when we pick up the New Testament, they're in their synagogues, they're worshiping 
the true God in their way, in their own way, but unfortunately they have developed this into a religion more than a relationship. They've got all these standards and, and methodologies, but there Paul enters into the synagogue, surrounded in a city, surrounded by idol worship, but the Jews in these synagogues we're still worshiping God or still uh, preaching and teaching out of the Old Testament and God. So he's there in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So he's gone to the market once again. He leaves the synagogue. He goes out to the market. These public, this public uh, place is full of people who are worshiping idols and, and gods. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. In the marketplace, some of these, there's, there's in, in Athens, you see a lot of philosophy. And you could join certain groups of philosophers. And in this case, there's a couple that are in the marketplace listening to this man named Paul give this account of this man, Jesus Christ. And some, would, and some said, what will this babbler say? What is this babbler talking about? Other, some, say, and other some say, he, he seemeth to be, to be a setter forth of strange gods. It sounds like he's talking about something that we haven't heard before, is what these philosophers are saying, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So then the quarterly stops because it's, it's wanting you to know that he has, he has reached an audience that has never heard about Christ and an audience that had never studied the Old Testament, presumably. So here are people who have no knowledge of the gospel, no knowledge of the history of the Jews, no knowledge of the Old, time, Old Testament prophets, but they are philosophers trying to discern themselves the meaning of life. That's what philosophy basically was doing back then, is why are we here as a human race, and what is our purpose here? And if you were of an Epicurean state uh, uh, sect, uh, you were basically believing that life was here. You get one shot at life. These were the eat, drink, and be merry uh, philosophers, if you're an Epicurean. You got one shot at life, live it to the fullest, you know, you're, you know make the most out of your life as you can, and don't wait until something else comes along. You just take care of yourself and enjoy yourself. In the, in the case of you know, sinful nature or the, the, the lust of the eyes, the, uh, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, the Epicureans were all about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. They said there's nothing wrong pursuing these things because you got one shot at this. You might as well enjoy it. This was their philosophy of life. They believed in gods. But they believed that gods had nothing to do with, do with mankind. They were much higher up in a complicated way. And, and we certainly, us peon individuals, certainly could not relate at all to the gods. So that was Epicureanism. If you were a Stoic, uh, you believed a little bit opposite of that. You believed that you had a purpose in life, but your only purpose was to be a prideful man. Take pride in who you are, and you live your life in all seriousness and all self-disciplined. Everything about your life was rigid, scheduled, routine, and directed towards self-discipline so that you could make a name for yourself to go into the annals of history as this man has evolved into this great person. In other words, their belief in God is God is everywhere and God is you. And you make the best you that you can make. And therefore, Stoics believed and you make a statement in life, everything you can become but it was all about the pride of life, building yourself up where the gospel is. Don't rely upon yourself, rely upon, you, you know, Jesus told us to deny ourselves. So he goes after both of these Epicureans and Stoics. But here's where the philosophers, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they believed everything was God. And therefore, you know, just, just make your own way. And, and, and when you leave this earth, let people remember who you are because that was about the pride. So they're listening to Paul. And they're saying that, you know, this, some are calling him a babbler. Others are saying he's preaching a strange uh, message about strange gods. And they, some are, are in, um, intrigued by him. And they say, let's do something. Let's, let's take him up to the Oropagus. Now, I didn't know what the Oropagus was. When you look at it, it's basically there was a hill there in Athens. They call it Mars Hill. We'll be familiar with that. Mars Hill was a place where... Um, 
philosophers would gather. They would debate each other on the meaning of life and their, their different philosophies and, and, and religions and things of this nature. And there was a court up there, a court of individuals, people that were actually set on this court, and they would debate and analyze and they would make uh, pronouncements of what they believe is to be true and all. It's almost like going up to the Supreme Court and having this debate, you know, in our own country. So when Paul is asked to go to the Oropagus, we don't know if he knew where he was going, if he knew how big of a deal this was. You know, Luke is the writer of this, and Luke is Greek. So if, you know, it's almost like Greek, uh, Luke, when he hears about this later, you can imagine Luke asking Paul, you, you went where? You, that you went to the Oropagus? You know, this was like you went to the Supreme Court to talk about the gospel? And Paul gets a chance to go there. So when that happens, it says this, and they took him and brought him. You don't have this in front, so if you'll indulge me to read a little bit. They took him and brought him unto Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherein thou speaketh, speaketh is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there at the Oropagus spent their time in nothing else but either to tell a new thing or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. He's at the Supreme Court. He's at the Oropagus. And he stands up and he says, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are way too superstitious. What a thing to state. If you're going to go in front of this, these thinkers, these philosophers, these people gather to debate the question of life and the meaning of life. And he is starting out his gospel message telling them that they're way too superstitious. Meaning that I've seen statues everywhere of all these gods. And he explains it, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. After all these other gods, there's even a tomb or a, uh, or a statue to the unknown God, who therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. Now what Paul is saying is the reason I am here is I noticed in passing through your streets that all these structures, these monuments to all these gods that you worship, there's one there that says to the unknown God, and the reason they're superstitious is they didn't want to leave anybody out. They didn't know all the gods. They didn't know there may be other gods that they are unaware of. So in their philosophical way, they're going to build a monument to the unknown God so that if, if there is an unknown God out there, they can still give honor to that, him or her or whatever, and no bad luck would fall upon them. They believed if they offended any gods, then they would bad luck. So they're way too superstitious. So Paul is telling them that I've seen this and you're way too superstitious. So then Paul begins to preach the message. But it's interesting. Paul has to preach to these people who have never heard the Old Testament prophets. Remember that? They, they don't know about prophecy. They don't know about a coming Messiah. They're just looking for the meaning of life. So Paul changes his gospel a little bit. It's still going to come down to the gospel, but instead he, create, he talks about God the creator, this unknown God monument you have. I'm going to tell you who he is. You know, it perks their ears up. I'll tell you who this unknown God is. God that made all that you see, heaven and earth, everything around, everything that we move and everything that, that we, we live in in our entirety, from the sun and the moon to the rain to, the, uh, to everything that you see was created by a single God. And he created you and me the same. Here I am a Jew, you are Greek, and, and there's all kind of races of people that, the, the, that these Athenians knew about. He said, all of us came from the same blood, meaning that God created all of us out of a single man. We're all created by God. And my message to you Athenians is, if you are created by a creator, then you have an obligation to worship that creator because you are the created. So he's trying to get into their minds and realize that, let's, let me tell you who the unknown God is. The, the God that you question is the one that created you, created everything around you. And by that alone, you have a responsibility to worship or give respect to that God. And I'm telling you who he is. But then he says that not only do we as human beings have an accountability and responsibility to that God, 
But in the past, in times past, God has winked at all of our disrespectful living, all of our lifestyles, all the debauchery and sinfulness that we've, that we've lived in. Now is a time of accountability. God is going to judge his created, and he sent his son as a perfect example of, of how one should live, and that son gave his life, and God has resurrected that son, and that son will come and judge all mankind on righteousness. Now, this is the message that Paul is preaching. He's not going necessarily into, like he usually does in the synagogues, reminding the, the people, the Jews, remember their old prophets in the Old Testament, how they prophesied about Messiah. Jesus is that Messiah, and I'll show you how he, he, he fulfills the prophecy. To these Athenians, he is saying, I want you to look around you. Everything that you see was made by God, and he had a son, and he sent him because he's going to make us accountable for how we live on this earth. So that which was perfected died for our sins, but God raised him from the dead. And as he gets to this point where he talks about the resurrected body and how that he was the body's no longer in the tomb and it was a glorified body, half the Athenians say, wait a minute, you're nuts. You've already lost me. Everything was going good when you were talking about the sun and everything we see and how God created this. But now that you've gotten into this death and resurrection, we, we don't... We're reasonable men. We don't, we don't deal with this, this craziness. So it says, as we pick back up, and when in verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked him, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So there are others on Mars Hill that are so intrigued by the gospel, but the gospel spoken in a different way, that it, it, it perks their mind to a point where they will hear this again. So the scripture, the, 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 uh, the, the chapter ends where it says, certain men clave unto Paul, unto him, that heard this message, this gospel, and believed, among the which was Dion Dionysius, the Areopagite, which is a guy that was on, remember I told you there was like kind of a court at the Areopagus that would hear these things and direct the debate and direct the discussion. They were the facilitators of this court. And this guy, Diasius, he was a believer. He believed in what Paul was saying. We don't know what he will do in the future. This is part of the beauty of what we can learn when we all get to heaven and all we will know all things. We may learn what this man may have done in the city of Athens, how he may have been a great leader in the early Christian church of Athens because he, a great man of Athens, is a believer of the gospel. And it says a woman named Damaris and others with them. There is a core group there that believe Paul's gospel. So here again, even on Mars Hill, the gospel is making a difference by challenging those that were learned, educated, um, debated daily. You know, sometimes that's the hardest people to reach are people who think they know all the answers and that they've already debated all this issue and that this is, you know, don't tell me. You know, your story, I've already debated all this. I know it. Sometimes they're the hardest ones to reach. Paul, in his gospel message, he does it in a different way. And he reaches certain individuals that we may never know what, what good they did in the city of Athens. So we go into chapter 19. He's already gone and met Aquila and Priscilla and Corinth. And he sailed back to Antioch. This is Paul. And now on his third missionary journey, he's going to venture into Ephesus. And this chapter 19 is where, you know, when he meets the disciples in Ephesus and he tell, asks them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they say, we don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. You know, that, that episode, these are, the church, these are the church members in Ephesus that Paul is going to speak to in chapter 19. And as it talks about him having somewhat of a, of a time in Ephesus, he is... Um, he is uh, preaching to these, these individuals, and they're about to have a revival. He's going to spend about three years in Ephesus, but during that time, they are, he's going to go into a, um, uh, he's going to leave the synagogues and go into an old school. They call it the school of Tyrannius, who was a teacher of the day in Ephesus. So Paul, as he was, he starts in synagogue, he goes to the marketplace. Now he's setting up his, his message after these, you know, during these three years stint, He's in his schoolhouse, somewhat, somewhat of a school, preaching to people. And this is where the revival is going to break out. So it picks up the gospel message. What kind of difference does it make? 
the gospel message goes forth. So we pick up in verse 11. It says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Special, meaning unusual. These are not your typical miracles of the blind eyes opening and all of that where, you know, he may lay his hands on someone and they receive their sight or they uh, come off their mat or whatever. These are special, unusual miracles. We don't know fully what they are, but we do remember Jesus saying that greater, than, greater things than these shall you do when they are marveling at Jesus' miracles. So maybe that's what Jesus was referring to. You're going to see things that you haven't seen through me. So special miracles by Paul, by the hands of Paul, so much, uh, so great that it says, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. He was a tent maker there in Ephesus, and he would have bits of his apron and all that. And the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now think about this. You're talking about unusual things. We see it today, and we grow up in Pentecostal churches, and if someone comes and they have a loved one in the hospital or at home and can't get to church, they'll ask for a prayer cloth. This is where it's coming from. Visitors to our church may think, well, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. They're going to take a piece of cloth to the guy that's hurt or, or unable to come, unable to come. And so, but we get that from this, this church in Ephesus. So many great miracles have, have happened that as Paul is traveling, he can't be everywhere at the same time. So they are just taking pieces of his handkerchief or pieces of his anchor, uh, apron, taking it to this person who is sick in body, full of disease or maybe unclean spirits, and they're handing that to them. And what this is indicative of is it's not in the cloth. The, uh, Pastor Green has told us every time he hands out a prayer cloth, it's nothing about the cloth. It's all about stirring up the faith of the individual that is about to receive the cloth. Faith is how you receive your healing. You must believe. And what Paul is doing here, is, or what the church leaders is doing here in Ephesus, Paul can't go to the hospital. Paul doesn't have time to go to your individual homes to pray for your loved one that is sick. But here's his handkerchief. Here's a piece of his apron. And when the person receives, this is from Brother Paul. They, in their mind, their faith is released so much that that is a point of connection, contact with Paul, whom they believe that has the power and the favor of God, that when they receive this, their own faith, I will receive my healing now. There's nothing in that apron. There's nothing in that claw, handkerchief, except a, a, a point of contact that they can release their own faith. And by their faith, they're healed. This is not to uh, discount the power of Paul, but it is to understand that when we do it today, there's, we buy these claws from, you know, from wherever. But when we anoint it with oil and we pray over that cloth, we are praying for God's, we are praying the prayer of faith so that when that cloth is given to that individual, their own faith is released, released and by the, the prayer of the saints and the faith of the believer, they receive their healing touch. That's the point of contact that, that this is all about. So a lot of things are happening in Ephesus to the point where it's making a, un, unbelievable miracles occur. And in verse 13 through 16, an event happens that we, are, we all, you know, we've read this our whole life, Christian lives, and it's always been fascinating to us. But there's something going on in the church and in, during a revival. Revival spreads. Word of it spreads. People from all over start coming and they're attracted to all the noise about you ought to go down to Ephesus and hear this guy and see all these miracles and the preaching of this gospel and all this is happening. But there's also certain people who have made a living doing certain religious things and they're hearing about a bunch of people gathering in Ephesus and they want to do the same thing and they call them in the scriptures vagabond Jews. These are people in the synagogues who have certain skills, certain abilities, or certain um, um, magical, or well, I shouldn't say magical, it's kind of like a circus act, really, where they, um, they call themselves exorcists. They can go into certain synagogues or certain areas, and through chantings or certain things, they can pretend that they are pulling out the evil spirits from a person who is, is um, melancholy or depressed or whatever, maybe sick or whatever. And it's kind of what we see in, in certain, a certain 
uh, religion today where people will sprinkle holy water on them and go through these incantations and all of that, and they'll try to exercise or to, to expel a, an unclean spirit. Well, they were doing this back in the early days. And these certain individuals are called vagabond Jews. They'd go from church to church, and they would perform this act or whatever. So we got these seven sons of Sceva that we want to talk about and how they, they performed this. Um, for the sake of time, what they did, we know this story. They go into the church in Ephesus, and there they believe to have a man who's got an unclean spirit in him. It apparently is noticeable. And they go up, and because they try various ways to extract the, the, the unclean spirit, this time they're going to use the name of Jesus because they're in a church of Christians. They're in a church, and they want to come and say, you know, just as Paul's doing this, we're going to do the same thing. And it could be, it could be this, that they're either wanting to get the same acclaim that Paul is. I got the same power that Paul has. Now, these are unbelievers of Jesus Christ. These are just Jews that are traveling with their show. And so they're, they're unbelievers of Christ, but they're either going to show you that what Paul's doing, we can do the same thing, kind of like Moses and the magicians of Pharaoh. We can do the same thing that Paul can do, and we're going to show you. Or they were totally ignorant of this thing, because if they, if they were saying that, hey, the, the demon came out when we proclaimed Jesus' name, and we're not even believers in Jesus— that can just show you that the whole thing's false. Or if the demon didn't come out, we can say, well, Paul, the demon doesn't do anything. I mean, you, you could tell that this is not true as well. But we know the story that they go and they, they, they adjure or command the demon to come out of this man. And they get everybody around and they, of course, say those famous words, uh, we adjure you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Not that we believe, not that we pre preach, but we adjure you. We command you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches to come out of the man. And they're ready for whatever extraction to happen, and they're ready for all the acclaim. And the scripture tells us that the man, the individual, the demon spoke through him. And those famous words of Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Now, if you're the, one of these seven sons of Sceva and you hear this demonic voice come out and says, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? You're a little worried at this point because this is not what was supposed to happen. The person was either going to be fall on the floor and be released of, his, of, of the demon or, you know, something was going to happen, but not talking back to me. And then even something worse happened where the man himself jumped on all seven of these sons and beat them half to death, ripped off their robes. They ran out of the church house fully you know, naked and running for their lives, and fear came upon the church. Now, you may say, well, what, what good is this? The gospel makes a difference is the title of the lesson. Paul, who's preaching the gospel, and is preaching that only a relationship through Jesus Christ can you cast out these demons, Paul is preaching this, and Paul is doing this. So when these traveling Jews, these vagabond Jews, come around trying to do the same thing, they see the end result. So much so that if you pick back up into where the Scripture laid, left off, it says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all the men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. What they were talking about is inside the church, inside the revival, there were people witnessing everything that back at home, they had their own witchcraft thing going on. They had their own books of enchantments and things and, and that they homespun remedies of sicknesses and all of this. They would rely on. It shows you the incredible... Um, amount of, of, uh, of demonic forces in these biblical cities in these days during Paul, that they, would, they brought in their books of homespun remedies and, uh, and sorceries and all of that, and they burned them in front of the church. We're done with this. We, we, after what we saw with the sons of Sceva, we want nothing to do with anything that looks like it's demonic. So the revival explodes at that point because you've got, you're getting people cleansed from stuff that they didn't know may, have, may not have realized was bad, but now that they've seen what the gospel message is and what real power of demonic activity, when you go against uh, demonic power without the
the power of the Holy Spirit without belief in Jesus, what happens? Now they're bringing all their stuff in. Let's burn it, get rid of it. I want to know this Christ even more. So at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. I won't, I won't do this anyway. I think this is important. It's always baffled me about the sons of Sceva. How can they go around casting out devils? You know, if they're not even believers in Christ. It take, the, my study took me back to the 12th chapter of Matthew. And I just want to read this real quick because it may help somebody. Because this is something where Jesus is confronting the Pharisees. And I've always wondered about this scripture. Didn't understand it. And you'll, you'll re recall it when I read it. It says, he was in the synagogue, and it says, then, this is talking about Jesus. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both um, spake and saw. His eyes were open, and he spoke. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? Is this not the Messiah? Is this not whom we've been searching for? But when the Pharisees heard it, when they heard what Jesus did to this demon-possessed person, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. They're saying that Jesus is casting out these demons in the name of, the, of Satan, by Beelzebub. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his uh, kingdom stand? And here's the important part, statement. And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Who, if I'm casting out demons by, by Satan, then what about your Jews, your children, your people who are doing the same thing? Casting out devils, therefore they shall be your judges. If you're telling me that I'm doing it by Satan, then they have to be doing it by Satan, and they're going to say, no, no, no. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. Now, what I'm saying is this. This was evidence that back in Jesus' time, there were Jews who would actually go through this procedure of exorcism and would cast out demonic powers. We don't know the full re reasoning. We don't know if, if Satan himself was doing this as a, as a way of saying, well, I'm going to... Uh, they do it through certain sorceries and all of that. Therefore, Satan can, his, his demons can come and go as they wish. But Jesus, when he cast out that demon and they said, you're doing it by Satan, he's saying, I didn't do it by Satan. If you tell me I'm doing it by Satan, then how are your own people doing this? All right. So we know that casting out demonic forces was something that was happening back then, whether it was true or false. What I mean by that is it was by Christ or by some other method, but demonic method. That's why when these vagabond Jews were, were going around to the church in Ephesus, they just thought they were going to do the same thing they had done elsewhere. So it was something that was going on. Getting back to the lesson. The same time there arose no small stir about that way, talking about the Christian way. Every, the word was spreading everywhere. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Whom he called together with the workmen of the like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have gotten our wealth. This is a fascinating story. Demetrius brings in all the silversmiths of the city. Saying, you know, a lot of this Christianity stuff we kind of mocked and laughed at, but it's growing every day. And they're stopping, they're stop, they've stopped going to the temples. Princess Di or, uh, Princess Di <laughs> the goddess Diana had a temple in Ephesus that was listed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was, it was on, it had 127 pillars that were 60 feet high and, you know, the sculptures everywhere. It was a magnificent structure and people would go there daily and worship this goddess in various horrible ways. And this guy, Demetrius, is saying, you know, I'm starting to see a, a decrease in attendance of these places 
Nobody's going to these shrines as like they should, and what is that going to mean to us? But we're going to start losing money over this. So, and moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but also throughout all of Asia, this Paul, this guy named Paul, has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Demetrius is going to put a stop to Paul. He's going to put a stop to this stuff because it is affecting their wallet. It's affecting their ability to make money off of something they know is false. When this starts talking to me, and then he starts telling these silversmiths, where's your civic duty? Where's your, your own self-interest? You need to take in charge of this, and we need to get rid of this guy, or it's going to impact our life. This gospel message is going to destroy our livelihood and the lifestyle that we have grown accustomed to enjoy. Now, think about that in today's world. The gospel changes lifestyles to a certain point where some people reject it because they don't want to change the lifestyle. It may affect how they do business. It may affect how they act, their active lifestyle may change. This is what the gospel does in making a difference. And it was making a difference here so much that they were ready to destroy and throw Paul out of here because he was destroying their own livelihood, no matter how false it actually was. I've got to leave for today, but the, the, the point of this whole lesson is that through these episodes that we studied, whether it was uh, the gospel being preached to educated people in Athens, making a difference there, to bringing uh, fear upon the church when they saw what demonic forces were really like and how that you better be with God to, do, to confront them, or whether it was confronting people who were making their living and their lifestyle based on a fraudulent thing, and how we in our own life today, what the message still, the gospel still does and still makes a difference in each individual life. Next week, we'll continue with the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, in, this, in this case, we're going to be talking about leadership, commending leaders to the gospel ministry. Hope to see you then. We're going to enjoy a wonderful morning worship service this morning, and I hope you have a, a good rest of your week.